Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Uh, Bert assigned me an impossible task, and that is to discuss the epidemiology of cancer in 25 minutes. So um, I have uh, decided to give you a very brief bird's eye view of some of the trends in cancer incidence or, and mortality, and then to spend the bulk of the time uh, talking about how the, the new advances in technology, such as we heard about from the first speaker, have truly revolutionized the principles and practices of how we now uh, conduct cancer epidemiologic research. So I entitled my talk, Cancer Epidemiology, The Past and the Next Generation. And I have taken my subtext from this Virginia Slims ad, where this beautiful young smoker says, you've come a long way, baby. And I've changed it to, we've come a long way, maybe. So that is the subtext of the talk today. Um, now, uh, we all, I'm sure you know, that the, long, the goal of epidemiology is to understand the etiology of, of diseases, acute and uh, chronic. And in fact, we teach students that epidemiology is the discipline of three Ds. It's the study of the distribution and the determinants of disease. But we cannot forget that our other mission as public health sciences is to translate these findings to advance public health and to change public behavior and promote health promotion. And if truth be told, many epidemiologists, myself included, have been far too focused on conducting the exciting etiologic research and neglecting the importance of translating these findings uh, across the translational spectrum in order to have public health impact. And we now recognize, as does the peer review process, that um, any etiologic research that we conduct should have translational relevance and that these two goals of epidemiology should be integrated. Now, in the past, we could say that translation was very difficult, and in fact, the findings of epidemiology could be lost in translation. For example, uh, in the 1600s, it was already known that if you gave sailors lemon juice, you could eliminate the problem of scurvy, but it took another 260 years for the British Board of Trade to mandate that uh, all the sailors should be given citrus fruits. Likewise, um, in 1950, two large case control studies were published showing that cigarette smoking caused lung cancer, but it took another 14 years before the Surgeon General published his first report on the health hazards of smoking with lung cancer. And most important of all, we've known since the 1960s that there was a problem in childhood obesity, but only recently have we tried to begin to develop systematic approaches to address the obesogenic environment that we all um, are facing. But the question is now, with social media, uh, is slow translation over? And to some extent, the answer to that is yes. The take home message that I would like you to remember is, this is an extremely exciting time to be a cancer epidemiologist. The questions that we ask are still the same as that were being asked 30 or 40 years ago. Why did this patient get cancer at this time? Could the cancer have been prevented? Could the finding be translated into public health impact? And could we have predicted this finding? And the question of prediction is the most tricky of all, and I like to use the example which is variously um, attributed to Yogi Berra and Dan Quayle, but I think in fact comes from Niels Bohr, the physicist. Predictions are risky, especially about the future. And uh, to illustrate this, I show you Mrs. Winnie Langley. Mrs. Langley um, died at the ripe old age of 103. She started smoking during the First World War because she was very scared of the noise of the bombs that were falling around her. She outlived two husbands and 10 stepchildren. 
And uh, in the old days, we would have just said that this is an anecdote and doesn't mean anything. But now, we might consider her an extreme phenotype. In other words, someone who is a resistant smoker. She smoked for so many years and did not develop lung cancer. And she could provide us with very interesting information on why she was resistant to developing lung cancer as opposed to a young never smoker who developed lung cancer. Uh, maybe both are enriched for genomic signals and we should think about studying these extreme phenotypes. Now, it is obviously clear that cancer epidemiology has made major advances in recognizing the causes of many uh, cancers. I've already spoken, and I'll come back to tobacco and lung cancer. Um, epidemiologic studies showed the association of asbestos from shipbuilding, construction, mining, and not only lung cancer, but also mesothelioma, which is cancer of the lining of the pleural cavity. Uh, showed that aniline dyes caused bladder cancer, ionizing radiation caused a variety of cancers, be they the ex uh, environmental exposures, medical exposures, or from um, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki atomic bombs, Chernobyl, they've all provided evidence of the hazardous effects of ionizing radiation. It was epidemiologists who first showed that women who got diethyl stilbestrol during pregnancy had a higher risk of their uh, female offspring developing a vaginal adenocarcinoma. Another example is the work of Dennis Burkett and the EBV virus and lymphoma. And finally, we're recognizing the importance of human papilloma virus in a variety of cancers, not only cervical cancer as here, but also oral pharyngeal cancers. So epidemiology has made major contributions this is not a very interesting slide, but it, uh, a pretty slide, but it is important because it was done, it was published in 1981 by two very famous uh, British epidemiologists, Sir Richard Dole and Sir Richard Peto, and they s uh, showed that about 30% of cancer deaths were related to diet. If I could work this, I might point out. Oh. And 30% were related to tobacco. And why I'm showing you this is because even though their, method, their statistical methods were somewhat criticized, uh, even today, the, the proportions would not be very different, although I would hazard a guess that the infection is higher than the 10% that they've given here. But the rest of the um, proportions are probably quite accurate. We've certainly had successes, uh, and this is a, a graph of cancer mortalities from the 1970s onwards. You can see that the mortality rate has decreased fairly dramatically for men, less so for women. And if we parse out the different types of cancers, this is uh, um, lung cancer in men, this is um, colorectal cancer, and you can see declines in gastric cancer, prostate cancer as well. Uh, the rate for women is, is similar. They're also starting to be declines in lung cancer, breast cancer declining, gastric cancer, and colorectal cancer. So clearly, we have had, and if you look at the successes for childhood cancer, they're even more amazing. The uh, five-year survival rate overall for pediatric cancers has gone from 50% to 80%, and for some childhood leukemias, it's actually over 90%. And this is just to illustrate the uh, tobacco picture in greater detail. As you can see here, people, this is the per capita consumption of cigarettes. They started smoking uh, in the First World War with, in great numbers. And in fact, uh, care packages sent to the soldiers always included cigarettes. This is the time we, uh, in the 1950s we reported uh, the association between smoking, lung cancer. Then there was the Surgeon General's report, and about 20 years later, you begin to see the decline in lung cancer mortality in, in men and in women who started smoking later, and I'm afraid are stopping smoking later. One of the Surgeon Generals said, women who smoke like men will die like men. I'm afraid he was correct. Um, so we've also had some failures. And now this is not a, uh, a, a, a map of Republican states, 
Uh, this is a map showing the tremendous increase in the prevalence of overweight and obesity. The um, purple states are those with a percent 50 to 55 percent um, obese. This was in 1990, uh, overweight, I should say, 1995. There were even a few states in red over 55 percent overweight. Here, the situation is worse in 1999, and the situation in 2007 is just uh, shameful. Fortunately, we'll be hearing a lot more about obesity from our next speaker. But I did want to highlight the epidemic of overweight and obesity that we're facing in our children. These are data taken from the National Health and Nutrition Exam Survey from the 1970s in three different age groups, um, two to five years. This is uh, um, 6 to 11 and 12 onwards, and you can see pr the increasing prevalence of obesity in each age group over each time period. This is really a national tragedy. And we know that there are uh, many cancer incidents associated with obesity, and we also know that obesity is associated with increased mortality for some cancers. The attributable risk uh, for obesity and endometrial cancer is about 55%. For colorectal cancer, it's about 15%. But we know that obesity is implicated in kidney cancer, liver cancer, um, adenosophag uh, adenocarcinoma of the esophagus, and so on. So we are really facing an epidemic of obesity in the, in the, in the country, and this is very urgent that something should be done about it. And um, as I've said, cancer survival rates overall have improved. Uh, they've gone up uh, in the lo in 10 years ago, it was 66%. It's a little higher now. But we've had some failures as well. Uh, you can see here in lung cancer, the survival rate, the five year survival rate is only 16. And even worse, in pancreas cancer, the survival rate has gone from 3 to only 5%. So there's a lot to do still to improve these survival rates of these highly lethal cancers. Um, now let's take the example of lung cancer. We know it is the most common cancer worldwide. 85% of all lung cancers are due to cigarette smoking. So if we were able to prevent just 10% of lung cancer deaths annually, that would be saving over 17,000 US lives because there are over 176,000 lung cancers diagnosed every year. And this 17,000 is equivalent to preventing all deaths from ovarian cancer or glioma, which is a highly malignant brain tumor. So when I started um, research in epidemiology in the 80s, um, the only tools we had were pen and paper, and we conducted classical epidemiologic studies. We had a questionnaire. We ascertained various variables, such as you know, smoking, family history, diet, specific exposures, and we correlated that with cancer risk. So if you looked at some of the seminal publications in, in 1980, um, there was uh, an uh, uh, important study on the role of um, asbestos, the role of diet, uh, that began to look at ethnic differences in lung cancer. Uh, Winder, Ernst Winter published the first paper on lung cancer in non-smokers. And then we began to realize that family history was also an important component of lung cancer, suggesting there might be a genetic component as well. So it's not surprising that there was a, an editorial in the New England Journal in 1987 describing epidemiology as a low-technology liberal arts science and a discipline readily accessible to non-specialists. Uh, times have changed substantially since then. So if we go on further, we then, in the 1980s, the concept of molecular epidemiology was advanced in which we um, merged our epidemiologic risk factor data with biochemical and molecular markers in order to understand better the mechanistic underpinnings of, the, of carcinogenesis. 
And in particular, we were looking at um, single um, gene variants, much of what was germline variants. We heard a lot about that in the previous talk. And these were generally in genes which were candidate genes, which we thought were likely to have an association with a specific cancer. And the goal then was to develop a new approach to prevention, much as the concept of precision medicine, although in those days it was called personalized medicine, was developing a targeted treatment depending upon the molecular profile of the patient. So we wanted to develop a, a prevention approach depending upon the risk profile of the person so that if there was a low risk, there would merely be a suggestion of a behavior change, higher risk, you might have a screening program that was not appropriate for the general population. And for example, for women with the BRCA1 mutation, screening, uh, surgery, prophylactic surgery might be the best approach. And we began to realize as well that prevention, patient care, and survivorship were all part of a continuum and that we all needed to work together for the health care of our population. And I firmly believe, and I still do today, that epidemiology is, should be considered the basic science of prevention. So there were some success stories with candidate genes. And um, for example, on chromosome 15Q, there is a cluster of cholinergic nicotinic receptor uh, genes. And it's well known that nicotine binds to these receptors with greater affinity than does the physiologic, anag uh, the physiologic agonist, which is acetylcholine. And excitation of the nicotinic receptors causes electrical bursts in the dopamine-containing neurons with the release of dopamine, uh, and therefore all the pleasurable feelings from the release of dopamine. And this results in reinforcement of the habit of smoking and continual self-administration, and therefore inability to quit. And we found uh, a candidate gene approach showed that this locus was significantly associated with various parameters of smoking dependency. And there was a biologic rationale, which I've just explained to you, why this candidate gene should be associated with a nicotine dependence. However, that was one of the success stories. Most of the candidate gene studies were not that successful. And part of the problem was that in those days, the platforms were very low throughput and expensive, so we could only study a few gene variants at a time and limited study size and therefore limited statistical power of our studies, and few of the associations were replicated. And part of the problem also was we failed to pick good candidates, and we didn't have wonderful projects like the ENCODE project where we could look at the functional relevance of many of these variants. So Michael Toon actually referred to the candidate gene era as the lost decade, and there's some merit in that. And the result of this was that uh, an editorial was published in Science uh, in, in which it was called Epidemiology Faces Its Limits, and the thesis of the editorial was that epidemiology had exhausted its true potential. Uh, there were quotes from leading epidemiologists saying, that they generate conflicting results, confusing the public. There are too many false, false alarms being sounded that we found everything we'll ever find, that the methods would be too crude for anything but the largest effects, and the future lies in the laboratory, not epidemiology, although we were already working in the laboratory. And I was terrified when this came out, and I hoped I just started the Department of Epidemiology, and I'd hoped that no one saw this, but sad to say everybody saw it. And there was a very senior medical oncologist at MD Anderson at the time, who I'm remaining anonymous, uh, he said that epidemiologic research is phenomenologic. Well, to be quite honest, I'd actually never heard that word, and I briefly wondered whether he had meant phenomenal. But I, had, <laughs> I, but I did detect the disparaging tone in his voice, and I realized this was not a compliment. So I felt a little bit happier when Tricopolis published an editorial the next year in the BMJ 
saying that epidemiology was likely to flourish, and he compared it to democracy as not being ideal, but the best approach to deal with the problems at hand. He did spoil it a little bit by saying that few epidemiologies are equipped to take, <laughs> undertake the task. Um, but then, uh, exciting times arose for epidemiologists. One very exciting time was the Human Genome Project, which was a, a $3 billion joint venture. It had a completion goal of 15 years. It was a multi-institutional, international project, also with private companies. And the object was to identify the entire set of genes, to analyze the genetic variation, to disseminate this information, and also to discuss and to understand the ethical, social, and legal issues of giving genetic information back to people. And noteworthy, it was completed in 2003, ahead of BUD, so it's probably one of the first, if not the only, government projects that was ahead of schedule and under budget. And this really transformed the way we practiced epidemiology, because now we no longer uh, studied a single gene under the light of a single lamppost, but we could study genetic variation across the entire genome, and that was called the genome-wide approach, and we heard quite a lot about it this morning. But we began to realize that as we are transitioning to these new technologies, we needed to develop a new approach to epidemiology. And these new technologies included high-throughput genotyping, high-throughput sequencing, all the new omics-based approaches, which are used for biomarker discovery and targeted therapeutics, new imaging, molecular imaging approaches, and of course, very powerful statistical and bioinformatic analytic tools, all of which were helping us explore the um, molecular basis of carcinogenesis and truly transformed the practice of epidemiology because we realized we needed to develop thoughtful, careful, and deliberate collaborations with a multitude of different disciplines. We needed to learn to understand the language of these different disciplines, and we needed to conduct very large-scale, well-designed, well-annotated studies. And we believed that epidemiology provided a framework for this integration. And the lure for epidemiologists to jump into these high throughput technologies was enormous. Um, and, uh, we, and epidemiology should help to inform, test, and validate these approaches. And these approaches also helped epidemiologists to characterize exposure outcomes and other phenotypes far more accurately. So it was a bi-directional win-win approach. So one example is back to our chromosome 15 uh, meta-analysis showing that in a total of over 14,000 heavy smokers and 10,000 lighter smokers, in all these different studies, we could find we could replicate the relationship between this locus on chromosome 15 and smoking intensity. Very powerful approach. Same approach to looking at the same locus and lung cancer risk. We find the same locus is associated with lung cancer risk. And we also found that there was no association in never smokers, but it was associated with cigarettes per day. So we believe that Part of the association of this locus and lung cancer is due to smoking um, intensity, but for a variety of reasons that I won't go into, this locus also influ influence, influences susceptibility to lung cancer. And there's biologic plausibility because NNK, which is the carcinogen in tobacco smoke, interacts with the receptors and it activates release of VEGF, AKT, and anti-apoptotic pathways, all of which are part of the hallmarks of cancer. Now, why is it important to identify risk factors for or genetic risk factors for lung cancer? Because we now know that screening with uh, spiral CT does save lives. There was a 20% reduction in the very large lung cancer screening test. However, over 7 million adults meet the entry criteria for this study. And there were many smokers who were not being eligible for this study who are at risk for lung cancer as well. So we needed to develop better approaches to identify which fraction of smokers is at highest risk for lung cancer. So what are the next steps? 
Well, we need to identify many additional uh, loci and we need to replicate these findings in different populations. We need to do many of the functional studies, some of which we've heard about. We can study intermediate phenotypes. For example, we know that chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is an intermediate phenotype between smoking and lung cancer. Smokers with COPD have a much higher risk of developing lung cancer. We need to develop risk assessment models, but most important of all, we need to translate these findings to both personalized prevention and personalized therapy. And clearly, this is all multidisciplinary approaches. How much time do I have? Okay, so I'll just go to the very last. Um, this is an example of how team science works at its best. We are studying over 200,000 cases of various different types and 200,000 controls with a custom array of over 600,000 B types. And this is a joint venture which will contribute enormously to sorting out the genetic architecture of lung cancer. And the very final example is the question of pharmacogenetics. We know that if you have a series of patients with the same disease, some will respond well, some won't respond at all, and some will have toxicity. So we need to merge our uh, epidemiologic data with genetic data. And here is the last example I have. We, uh, sorry. Um, we showed uh, that what well, we didn't, but others did, the epidemiologists were able to show that a specific EGFR gene mutation, a somatic mutation, was in much higher risk in Asian, in women, in never smokers, and in adenocarcinoma. And um, knowing this, they were able to develop targeted therapy uh, so that patients who were positive for the EGFR mutation um, did significantly better with the targeted therapy than did patients uh, who were, received standard therapy of platinum and taxol. And the reverse was true for those who did not have the mutation. So this is a wonderful, successful example of a targeted therapy. So the final take-home message is, even though we have all these exciting new technologies, we must never abandon careful, pristine epidemiologic study design, careful selection of populations. We have to recognize the enormous challenges in, in handling the data, visualizing the data, and analyzing the data. Above all, we have to recognize the value of team science, and it's incumbent upon academic institutions to reward team science. And we need to work to translate all our findings. And finally, I would like to end by quoting uh, Stoney Stallones, who was the dean of the School of Public Health when I was a student there, he said, "If it, I can't pronounce it as well as he did, if it ain't fun, it ain't epidemiology. Thank you very much. Wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Nicholas Peppers from the University of Texas at Austin. Before you get the serious questions, Trichopoulos was an epidemiologist. Yes. Uh, Dimitri Trichopoulos was at Harvard and the University of Athens, and unfortunately, he passed away about two weeks ago. Oh, I he didn't was, know that. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it was a major loss. He was also a member of the Academy of Athens uh, and of IOM, I think. Uh, uh, and he was always very, very passionate supporter of epidemiology. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I, actually, I, I've met him and we discussed his paper in quite great detail. Thank you so much for that comment. Yeah, I quite enjoyed this. Um, I'm an engineer, so I'm not from your bioscience side of uh, this group. And so the question may not be at the level that you would like, but I'm curious, uh, you showed some uh, general historical results on smoking. Um, is there something coming in yet about the e-cigarettes? It's too soon. Um, I mean, you mentioned some things about ca uh, the, not the caffeine, the uh, 
anyway, but, uh, uh, but, but you never said that it's causing the cancer. I always thought it had something more to do with uh, carbon in the lungs and these sorts of things. So are there thoughts on that yet? Well, so there are two questions. The one is you're asking about e-cigarettes, and I'm sure you all know that this is a, unfortunately a, quite a craze among young people and older people as well, where it, it's a vaporized type of, of smoking. I, do, I don't believe, certainly um, it's said that this could help smoking cessation, but I don't believe there are any data to show that at all. And in terms of is it safe to use, I don't believe the data are in for that also. There are some harmful components in, in the vaporized um, mechanism as well. So it's certainly not something that should be encouraged at all. And in fact, I think it should be banned, but um, uh, that's not for me to say. Uh, and in fact, the, the tragedy is they put in various types of flavors to attract people to buy it and enjoy it. And um, I, I really think this is not a, a, um, a wise approach at all. And it, they try and sell it as a way to you know, help people stop smoking. There are no data to show that this is successful at all. And your other question, sorry, was... Well, I'm sure that you might be better off because you probably have less level of exposure, but certainly it, I, I, we can't say at the moment that it's safe, and it's not something that we would recommend to anybody. Have we got time for any more? Okay. Uh, there's been a, a, a paper that came out, I think, uh, within the last four or five weeks from Vogelstein, uh, in which he suggests that cancer is is random in, in terms of the high mutation rate that occurs with rapidly replicating cells. And uh, so I wonder if this uh, observation might not be merged well with epidemiologic data in which you take the outriders, uh, let's say smoking, in which you take early onset of uh, neoplasia, uh, and you look at DNA repair mechanisms. And you take the outriders of the, your lady from England, <laughs> 100 years old, uh, and look at her repair mechanisms because it, it looks like the carcinogens are raising the epidemiologic risk. And if uh, Vogelstein is correct, it's, it's all about repair and randomness. Actually, you've raised a very interesting point because um, one of my colleagues when I was at MD Anderson worked exclusively on DNA repair capacity. And in fact, we showed that light smokers or never smokers with lung cancer um, had significant poorer repair than long-term smokers with lung cancer. So we actually even believed that long-term exposure to um, a, a mutagenic agent resulted in upregulation of DNA repair capacity. So I think DNA repair capacity is a very important factor. And in fact, I, I, on my slide, I didn't have time to talk about it. I had that as an intermediate phenotype because that's how important I think it is. So I think you've raised a very important point. And um, I think Vogelstein's paper is fascinating, yes. Thank you.